talk to you about the impact of that core of investigative findings that have resulted in a prosecution decision that I am announcing today. Specifically, I want to indicate that after very careful examination of all of this evidence, comprehensive and broad, the United States Department of Justice, including my office as the U.S. Attorney, Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, and the FBI and its concurrence, has determined that there is insufficient evidence to prove a prosecutable violation of the applicable federal criminal civil rights statute. Now, as we indicated many months ago, that particular statute is Section 242 of Title 18 of the United States Code, and it's described sometimes as a deprivation of rights under color of law. I'm not going to engage today in a lengthy examination of the legal trappings of that, but there are some aspects of this that I think the community needs to hear, as have the families this morning, to understand and comprehend more accurately the reason for our decision not to pursue a prosecution of any of the officers involved in this tragic death. Specifically, specifically, in order to prove a violation of a criminal civil rights law, Section 242, prosecutors, federal prosecutors, need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, and that is always the case in criminal cases, but especially important for the community to understand today, beyond a reasonable doubt, that any of those involved officers acted unreasonably and willfully in doing what they did. That is, with some specific intent to do something that the law forbids, a specific intent to do something forbidden by the law, to deprive an individual of his constitutional right. That may sound like a lawyer talking, and it is, but there's importance behind that, because it is a standard by which we analyzed all of the evidence that Teresa has described and made this decision. Now, as we did that, it's also important for the community to understand that the team of prosecutors from my office, the Civil Rights Division, all of whom are gathered here today, and the special agents of the FBI who are also present today with us and with the family, pursued two separate but very much related tracks, two theories under this particular investigative scheme. First, whether any of the Milwaukee police officers that evening willfully used unreasonable force during Mr. Williams' arrest. Willfully used unreasonable force during Mr. Williams' arrest, such as excessive force while restraining him on the ground. That was one of the avenues of our pursuit. The second parallel and much related part of our inquiry was whether any of the officers willfully and unreasonably failed to respond to Mr. Williams' medical need. Each of those words is important, and each of those words is a part of our analysis, whether any officer willfully and unreasonably failed to respond to Mr. Williams' medical record. Now, why do I say that? I say that because willfulness, willfulness under the law, under the federal criminal rights statute, is the very highest standard imposed by the law, and it is, as all of my colleagues know, an extremely high burden to meet. This is very important. Mistake, misperception, negligence, error, and bad judgment, all of those kinds of things are insufficient to establish the requisite intent for a federal criminal civil rights violation. It is insufficient to proceed in a prosecution in the wake of misperception or negligence or error. That is not the standard by which we evaluated this case and is not the standard upon which we make this determination not to proceed to the prosecution today. Rather, it is willfulness, that very high standard. Let me talk a little bit about what some of the medical evidence confirms, as Teresa has just likewise indicated. As she told you, the investigation revealed that there was no medical evidence to corroborate the use of unreasonable force by any officer. Teresa already indicated to you and gave you some sense of what some of those witnesses testified to. The vast majority of those witnesses, as Teresa indicated, provided no evidence of any willful violation of the applicable civil rights statute. That's the vast majority of the people interviewed and witnesses to the event. There were, there were a couple who reported observing some unreasonable force, but those, as Teresa said, those accounts were inconsistent with the other physical trappings of the evidence and uncorroborated by the other broad body of evidence assembled. And let me be very clear on that. There has been some indication in the community, some reporting, that Mr. Williams may have been beaten or tied or tased 
or otherwise um, involved with the officers in some inappropriate uh, physical beating of some kind. There is no evidence to indicate that that was the case, and the evidence, both the witnesses and the physical evidence, do not support any of those conclusions. I should also say that there is insufficient evidence that the response by any officer, any of the officers, to Mr. Williams' medical need was objectively unreasonable or carried out with the willful intent that I've described before. 